Welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we're really excited to have author and attorney Lainey Feingold here with us. She is a longtime disability rights lawyer, and she's written a new book that we will be talking about called Structured Negotiation, a winning alternative to lawsuits that was just published by the ABA. So today, your Law School Toolbox host is Allison Monahan, and normally I'm here with my co-host, Lee Burgess. And together, we're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the Catapult Career Conference. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we're very excited to have attorney and author Lainey Feingold here with us. She is a longtime disability rights lawyer and has developed a technique called structured negotiation. That's the subject of her new book, Structured Negotiation, a winning alternative to lawsuits. This was just published by the ABA, and we'll be talking about how you can get yourself a copy. I read it. It's very interesting. So welcome, Lainey. Uh, To start off, why don't you give people a quick overview of your background, including how you became involved in this disability rights work? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm oh, excited to so have excited. this conversation. Pleasure. <laughs> excited to have this conversation with you. Um, yeah, I graduated from law school in 1981. Uh, I went to Hastings in San Francisco, and when I graduated, I really wanted to be a union side labor lawyer, and I wasn't able to get the job I wanted right away, which I know will resonate with some <laughs> many of our listeners. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? It's great. I was just talking to a friend this morning. It's kind of nice to be 60 because you can look back and you can see that a career t- twists and turns as mine certainly did. Uh, so I went to work for the government for a year and a half until I could get the union side labor job I wanted. And I did it for five years and I realized, you know what? I don't really like this. Hmm. Even though this was my whole goal of, you know, going to law school and all the work and internships and jobs I did while I was in law school. So I switched over to a private civil rights firm. And from there, I ended up at a disability rights nonprofit. And hmm. from there, I have my, have my own practice, and I've had it for 20 years. No, that's really interesting. I think, uh, you know, I think that definitely will resonate with a lot of people, um, both not necessarily being able to get the job and then finding out that you got the job and it's not really what you thought the job was going to be. So I'm actually curious to drill down on that just a little bit. I mean, tell me a little bit more about sort of why you thought this was going to be a good fit initially, the union side stuff, and then you found out it wasn't. Like, was it the work? Was it, you know, what was it that you found wasn't what you thought you would like to do? Um, Well, first I have to say I liked it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it, over time, it, felt that the work that I was doing was mostly representing individual workers in unions who had disciplinary issues, Mm. which is an important issue for workers in unions. But I think when I went into it, I had this more idealized view that I was going to be like, on the front lines of big issues and right you know making big changes and you know I love the people I work with I'm still friends with many of them today but the actual day-to-day work didn't really mesh with my idea of the work I was doing Mm -hmm. and it sounds like you had explored the option pretty thoroughly before you got the job I mean this wasn't like you graduated and then just randomly decided to do this yeah that's true I worked um for several different union side labor firms in San Francisco during the summers and also during the school year. And I had, in fact, Allison, this is how we met. We connected through Twitter (laughs) because when I was a second year law student, I was uh, chair of the program committee of the Women in the Law Conference that uh, was a prior incarnation to a current Women in the Law Conference. And in that job, which was a unpaid job, I met so many women lawyers around the country and really had exposure to a lot of different types of law that women were doing at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. I mean, it's the same thing, I think, for a lot of people who take these firm jobs. It's like, okay, you were there for the summer and you thought this was going to be so exciting and your cases were going to be on the front page of the paper. And I I guess sometimes they are, but I think for a lot of people, you know, once you get into that a couple of years into it, 
you know, a lot of people sort of realize, okay, this is either not what I thought or it is sort of what I thought, but it's not for me. I think that's a, you know, a very telling story regardless of what type of work you do in the law. Absolutely. Honestly, I think it's a telling story for any kind of work you well, do. True. <laughs> <laughs> both my daughter. Yeah. I mean, both of my daughters are teachers and you know, there's the idea of being a teacher versus the actual work of being a teacher. I think that's definitely uh, one of those professions where people get into it and go, Wow, this is really not what I thought I was gonna spend my time doing. Yeah, yeah, one of the things I always tell people when they say, you know, well, what should I do in my career? I'm like, you're not really deciding your whole career. You're deciding right. what are you going to do right now that seems like a fit and be sure to keep evaluating it and make sure it stays a fit. And if I hadn't done that, I would not have been in a situation to have a really interesting law practice that caused me to write a book about it. Right. I think that's right. I mean, that's what we tell people. Like, look, you're not deciding the rest of your life right now. You, know, you just have to sort of take a step that seems like maybe it could work out for you. And if it's not working, figure out where to go from there. You know, the idea of having a five or a 10 year plan, I think for most people coming out of law school, is just not that realistic. And I think it can put a lot of pressure on people that to try to do something that's just not possible. Absolutely. I never had a five or a 10 year plan. Well, or good. Two, I'm glad to hear that. Or two-year plan for that matter. <laughs> I know. I'm more like, uh, I once had a therapist tell me I had a radically short-term time horizon. He's like, you basically can't plan more than about three months in advance. And I was like, okay, well, that's useful to know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was listening on NPR and someone just wrote a book about what is the meaning of now. Hmm. And it's like a physics book for non-science hmm. people. Interesting. Hmm. How far out do you plan and what is current? Right. Well, I read your book, and it sounds like there's an interesting story in there about, I mean, this sounds like kind of a crazy story. You were fired from a firm the day before you were expecting to make partner. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Uh, yeah, I thought it was funny that you pulled that out of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's weird. You should, the, the book has nothing to do with this, in case you're wondering. I was just like, wow, that sounds like there's an interesting, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it was interesting to me too. Um, yeah, I, so I went to the union labor firm and I became a partner there. And it was after becoming a partner that I realized it just didn't seem like the right fit. So I went to a civil rights firm and I ended up, um, you know, thinking I was doing great and on the track and I had a short track because I had been a partner before. And like you said, the Pretty much the day before, I'd already talked about the parking space and the new <laughs> furniture and all this stuff, and it was not to be. And right. it was devastating at the time, but uh, the reason it worked its way into a, the book is because the book is about negotiating without lawsuits. And uh, in the last chapter, I talk about just various qualities that make for a good negotiator in my experience, and one of them uh, is equanimity, you know, the ability not to get riled by your, by your, you know, clients or your opposing counsel. Mm -hmm. And when I got fired, the person said, you know, you can't be a partner here because you lack equanimity. Which I thought was very I, odd. I mean, I've only met you once, but you seem like someone who would be, you know, pretty even keeled. <laughs> well, yeah, this is a thing. Like, how was I then? I've been thinking about that, you know. But again, it just, you know, all the wisdom traditions have this idea, one door closes, another opens, right. it's a real principle in psychiatry. And the reason it's a long standing idea is because it kind of is true. And yeah. that's what happened to me. Yeah, I just I found that super interesting. You're like, Oh, yeah, I'm picking out my furniture. And suddenly it's like, actually, you're unemployed. It's like, Whoa, all right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is how it felt. And that's how it was. Right. Well, I mean, I got a cold offer from one of the firms I summered at, which is also like, well, okay, that's weird. I mean, that wasn't totally unexpected because I hated them too. But, you know, it is one of those situations where you're like, wow, all right, that was not the way this was supposed to work out. What am I going to do next? Yeah, resilience is a really important trait to have. Yeah, I think absolutely. General, and I think especially when you're starting a career. I mean, the great Leonard Cohen, who, you know, just died, he... He has this great song about where the light comes in, where the cracks are. Mm -hmm. And if you're open to it, for me, it just nothing could have been better than that experience. Yeah, I for, think some, in hindsight. yeah, exactly. In hindsight, not at the moment. No, I think sometimes you have to be forced into these things, too, to be like, you know what? That probably wasn't going to end up going all that well. Good thing that they decided to reject me suddenly. <laughs> but at the time, it's not necessarily where you're at. 
All right. Well, let's shift gears a little bit um, and talk about the structured negotiation process. So tell me in a nutshell, what is this all about and kind of how did you develop it? Well, structured negotiation is a way to resolve legal claims without lawsuits. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it's an alternative dispute resolution process. It's very direct. So sometimes the parties can bring in a mediator, but it's not mediation Mm -hmm. because there's not always a third party. And the way it developed is when I got fired from that job, I ended up in a very short-term position at a disability rights nonprofit. And during that time, a blind lawyer called and he wanted access to ATMs. And Mm -hmm. at at the time, there were no accessible ATMs. And so we're like, well, the Americans with Disabilities Act was new. We could file a class action. What should we do? And we hit upon this idea to just write letters to the banks And we wrote to Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and Citibank in the mid-90s. We said, you don't have any ATMs that work for blind people. It's a violation of the ADA. But rather than sue you, could we sit down and try to find a solution? And at the time, there were no accessible ATMs anywhere in the world. And as a result of those letters, (coughs) the bank said yes, which was surprising to us. Because, you know, especially as a young lawyer, just so primed to prime for the fight, Mm -hmm. you know, assuming the other side is going to say no or give you a fight. But they didn't. They said yes. And four years later, we had written legal agreements with all of them with this brand new technology. And my colleagues and I, who I worked on the cases with, were like, whoa, this, I wonder if this would work for other issues Mm -hmm. because we didn't have to do depositions. We had joint experts instead of opposing experts. And it was just so much more collaborative and mm-hmm. cooperative and less stressful. And so that's how it started. And since then, I've used the method in about 75 different cases and other lawyers have used it. And, you know, as I say, it's a tool in the toolbox. It's not the only tool. I'm not saying it's the best tool, but lawsuits just can't be the only option for resolving legal claims. Right. Well, I mean, I was a litigator, so I would definitely agree with um, (laughs) that statement in large part. I mean, the reality is most lawsuits are not ultimately resolved in litigation. I mean, there may be a case, but they're not, you know, they're not going to jury trials or anything like that. I mean, basically almost everything settles. Um, Just I'm curious, I mean, what do you, what at the time did you see as the drawback of sort of one of these more typical like alternative dispute resolution options like mediation? I wouldn't say we saw it as a drawback. It just, in some ways it developed organically because when we sent the original letters and in my book, I talk about how to write what we call an opening letter instead of a demand letter, (laughs) how to write an I have a lot of suggestions for language changes that is one of my favorite parts of the book when I realize, like, why call people defendants if you mm. don't want them to defend Right, and I thought the, the shift from having a plaintiff to, what did you call them? Um, like claimant, we call them claimant. Right, I like the claimant because it makes it clear, like, oh, they have a real claim on this, you know, they're not just complaining. Yeah, exactly, and so... Uh, It wasn't like we said, oh, we don't want mediation. We just thought we'd try this letter. Um, At the time, we did attach a federal complaint, and our letter was very threatening and, you know, sit down with us. Over the years, I've come to realize that it's not only not necessary, but a lot of times it backfires to be so aggressive and threatening in the opening letter. Mm -hmm. And that you know, and in the book, I talk about how to write a letter that is more of an invitation to solve a problem rather than a threat of a legal claim. Right. And that's one of the things I found most interesting in the different stories that you tell in the book is that it seemed like people really were approaching it more as problem solvers. And so oftentimes your clients, you know, the claimants, people who had these disabilities or whatnot would end up going into the lab, you know, with the ATM designer to talk about what might work. Like I found that whole thing quite fascinating because that would mean it's very hard to imagine that happening in a lawsuit context. Exactly. And that's really one of the highlights of this process, I think, is that the role the clients have, and they can have a bigger role because they're not put in a box of plaintiff, and they're not put in a box of having to have a deposition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kept doing the process, and I decided to write the book because I just really feel it's a method that can work 
in a variety of contexts. And we just have to be confident. I talk about confidence in the book that it's so easy to think, oh, this isn't going to work. We may as well do a lawsuit. But the truth is lawsuits don't always work out either. Right. There's definitely a high risk on either side. Um, I mean, that's why everything settles. I mean, my personal theory after going to trial once or twice was that only crazy people go to trial because anyone else is going to settle the situation. Um, I mean, do you think there's certain types of disputes that are more or less suited for this? I mean, would you say there's certain categories of disputes that you're like, oh, absolutely, this would never want to, this would never work. You should never try it. Do you have any? Well, you know, that was something that I wrote many pages of that are not in the book Hmm. (laughs) because I had ideas like, well, first of all, there's a very important need for lawsuits. And in the current political period we're about to enter, there's going to be more of a need. Right, and that's when you need precedent, basically, right? Yeah, you need precedent, you need courts. I mean, like I give it in the book, I say, you know, obviously marriage equality or Brown versus Board of Education, there's certain things you want a legal system to to speak to, Mm -hmm. but most cases aren't that. So what I've been saying as people ask me that question now that I'm out talking about the book is it's really up to the readers. You know, I tried to create a book where each piece sort of stood on its own how to write the letter, how to do ground rules, how to exchange information. And I'm hoping people will write to me and say, hey, you know, I tried it in this context and it worked or it didn't work or I tweaked it. So ask me again next year and I'll have (laughs) an answer for you. Right. Well, I mean, I did patent litigation. And so I was thinking, like, could I see this really being a system that works in those type of cases? And I think, well, it was actually interesting because I think historically, the approach that you're talking about was basically more or less what people would end up doing. You know, they had, you had big company A and big company B, they were in the same industry and they each had a huge portfolio of patents. If one of them got angry with the other, they would basically sit down and figure out, okay, we'll trade these, maybe some money changes hand. But, you know, it was essentially defensive ownership of patents, whereas now that's totally shifted where you have, you know, the non-practicing entities, the trolls, that kind of thing. And that's really you know, what the patent litigation system is essentially about at this point. Yeah, I mean, I write in the book about how it's a process, structured negotiation is a process that allows people to preserve relationships, even if they happen to have a legal dispute with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think our profession as a whole has kind of lost the ability to talk directly to each other. We think we need a third party to to be in the middle. And I'm hoping that you know, father knows best needs to decide everything for us type of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a good that's a good way to think about it. And so I'm hoping that's why in the back of the the last chapter in addition to talking about equanimity, I talk about optimism and confidence because I think if you have faith in your ability to problem solve, a lot of times you'll be able to. No, not always. There's right. going to be you know, some cases you can't do it or bad actors or bad faith or whatever. But assuming everyone's trustworthy and in good faith, I think there's a lot of times we can solve problems on our own. No, I think that's right. I mean, when friends come to me, you know, with like, I want to, so-and-so's, you know, I feel like you're a lawyer, you know, my landlord's being mean to me or someone's not giving my security deposit back, you know, all these things that I'm sure you have your friends come and ask you to help them with too. Um, but my my first instinct and what I usually say in these situations is like, look, give them one opportunity to do the right thing. You know, ask politely for what you want. Tell them why you think you should get this. And then like literally, like legitimately give them the opportunity to do the right thing. And then if they don't, fine, you know, you can go to small claims court or whatever, but I don't think you should start there. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, we do that with our clients, even with this process, Mm -hmm. because one of the things when you know, when you don't have a judge or court rules or civil procedure like we don't have, one of the first things we hear from companies are, well, you should have told us. So we have to be able to say, well, you know, our clients did call your customer service right. line or, you know, talk to their supervisor or whatever it is, and they didn't get any result and they only went to a lawyer because they had to. And right, exactly. I've, <laughs> I've had to say that a lot. And it, you know, well, for those I mean, that's, listen- that's the case any anywhere, I think, you know. I once ended a relationship with a bank that I'd had an account at for something like 17 years because the person on the phone refused to refund some ridiculous fee that they shouldn't have been charging me. 
And I was like, look, I'm just like, I want to be clear about this. You know, you're going to lose me as a customer for 17 years over $14. It's like, yes, that's our policy. And I'm like, and you're telling me there's no one I can talk to who can waive that policy. No, there's nothing we can do. I'm like, fine, I'm going tomorrow and I'm closing the account. And I did. I went in and I closed the account. And of course, once I'm in the bank, they're like, oh, no, that's not our policy. Like, of course, we can waive the fee. We don't want to lose you. It's like, no, done. <laughs> you know, like you uh-huh. had the chance to do the right thing here. I believe the guy who told me it's your policy. You're going to waive it. But that's not the point. You know, the point is you shouldn't be doing this. Well, I tell the story in the book of how one of our early ATM clients came to us is because he was blind and the company, the bank started a policy of charging. It was only two dollars but they were charging to go to a teller window to take out money because they were trying to steer people to the ATMs. Mm-hmm. And blind people couldn't use the ATMs. Yeah, I thought some and, of the ideas they came up with too for like, oh, how are we going to solve this problem were pretty funny actually. <laughs> yeah, and so this guy, I mean, he like left the bank and found a lawyer. Right, I mean, okay. what else are you going to do in that scenario? Like, okay, this is not right. Fine, it's a couple of dollars, but this shouldn't be happening. Exactly. I mean, you also just wonder, like, did anyone, did no one think about this? In terms of the accessibility? Right, like internally. Or, did, and, you know, did, did no one at any point in like these banks think like, oh, well, maybe there are people who are going to have, you know, this is going to have a negative impact on who need to see a teller because we don't let them use the ATM. Yeah, well, fortunately, that is no longer anyone's policy, but. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, well, I think part of the, part of the issue with disability is that people, It's exactly that. They don't think of it. I I do a lot of work on website accessibility, mobile accessibility. And some of it is nobody's thinking when it comes to design, you know, like they put up a video without captioning. They're not thinking about their customers who can't hear the video and need captions. Right. Actually, I took to heart your uh, comments about the CAPTCHA, I think it was with the baseball client or the baseball um, negotiation. Because we had a couple of captures up, and I was like, oh, I'm sure they have, you know, the alternative. Do you want to hear this? And I went and checked, and like one of them didn't. And I was like, oh, whoops, got to change this, <laughs> you know. And I used to be a web developer, so I should know better. Well, you know now, so that's okay. <laughs> right, but I was like, well, you know, at least that my small part for the world, people can use my like anyone who is blind and using a screen reader should not be able to submit something to me through my contact form. So if you're listening to this you are welcome to submit comments through our contact form and it should work. If not, let us know. Um, right, so I, mean, I think the whole process is really interesting. I thought this idea of using, you know, not having competing experts was really, seemed like a very critical thing potentially. I mean, you know, obviously in patent cases, that's like the thing is like, you know, the battle of the experts. You have to jump through all these ridiculous hoops about you know, not ever having copies of their report that are saved anywhere. I mean, it's just like on and on and on. It's like such a waste of time and money. Yeah, I think that that I tell the story in the book a little bit that before I was doing this work with blind people, I was doing wheelchair access cases. And we did a big case uh, with Shell Oil Company on the accessibility of their service stations all over the country. We covered 4,300 stations for wheelchair users. And it was kind of a structured negotiations because we wrote the letter. We negotiated a whole deal with them. We ended up filing with their agreement because they wanted class protection. But we were using the experts the way experts are used in litigation. And it was just so expensive that I really think that's where the idea was hatched. Like, you know, there's got to be a better way with experts. Oh, because they're like easily $500 plus an hour. Yeah, so Chapter 8 is all about experts and the stories of some of the experts we used. And the other piece that I realized, you know, when you write a book, you have to really think about things that you take for granted while you're doing the thing. Mm -hmm. And the clients really get to be experts in Mm. this process, whereas in a regular litigated case, they're very sort of what the client thinks is all seen through a filter of, well, they're the plaintiff, and so, or they're the defendant, so they have a point of view. You can't really trust their expertise. Right. This seemed almost like more of a sort of almost like an engineering approach, you know, like let's get in a room and figure out, you know, what the end user needs. Yeah, that's how it worked in our cases. But I think that the idea of the joint expert is something that can really carry over to other other types of cases where people are really interested in resolving the claim Mm -hmm. in a cost-effective way. 
Yeah, I mean, my experience with experts was always like, all right, what do we, what, what, what do you need me to say in my report? You know, what's our argument here? And it's like, you know, in an ideal world, your expert should not be asking the lawyer what your argument is. The expert should be going out and being like, oh, okay, this is what, you know, these are the facts or whatever it is. I think it's just gotten really, the whole expert world has gotten really warped and twisted. Yeah, totally. I mean, when I wrote the book, I interviewed various people who, you know, I had used as experts and many of whom became my friends. And until I wrote the book, I hadn't really realized, well, you know, they also have been experts in cases, right. so they could file cases, so they could really talk about the different, you know, for them, the different experience of being in a negotiation where the goal is problem solving versus. Right. It might not be as lucrative. It's definitely a good gravy train if you could be an expert in like a very contested litigation. That is, you know, that's going to send your kids to college, literally. Yeah, but in this way, you could be in five structured negotiations at the same time you're spending. Right, you might actually be doing something productive for the world <laughs> instead of, you know, whatever your lawyer wants you to say, basically. Um, all right, well, let's move on to a little bit different topic. So a lot of our listeners are law students, um, and we hear from a lot of people, you know, the typical story, they want to help the world when they decide to go to law school, but then they kind of find these goals evaporating you know, once they get into this pressure cooker atmosphere that you have at most law schools. So do you have any ideas about what law students can or should be doing if they're interested in working in some alternative type of practice, Um, you know, not the sort of traditional legal litigation firm, that sort of lifestyle? Yeah, um, I was thinking about that in advance of this, and it was that way when I went to law school too. Right. Honestly, I mean, at the time, Hastings was a very big law school. I think we had 500 people in our class. And I always felt like, oh, thank God I found my people, which were like seven of us (laughs) or (laughs) 10 of us. And one of the ways we found our people, just as an aside, is that the torts professor on the very first day was trying to teach us what a demur is. And he said, I don't mean demure like a young lady should be. (laughs) I mean, demur, and then several of us booed, and then we found each other. <laughs> wow, that's classic. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of different ways to practice law, and for some reason, law schools have gotten into really emphasizing the one, you know, the big law way, which is not for everyone. Well, it's, it's not people. even a realistic option for most people. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of firms that, you know, smaller size firms, and nonprofits. I mean, unfortunately for all of us, the federal government is kind of off the table (laughs) the next four years as a way to, you know, make a positive impact. But you know what? There's people in federal government jobs, lawyers I know who have done great work in the last eight years who are staying and who are, you know, going to do what they can do. And so that's an option for some people. And I just think you have to hold, just really find your center and know what you want to do. I'm curious, do you have any ideas? Because one of the questions we get a lot is from students saying, look, I realize I either don't want a big firm job or I'm not qualified, they're not going to hire me. But it seems to be really hard for people to find work in these smaller firms, either over the summer or after they graduate. Do you have any thoughts on how people might go about either building those relationships or finding those jobs? Uh, That's a good question. I remember when I, at the time I got fired from the job and I was like, what am I going to do now? Um, It's not ideal to be in a contract relationship, you know, as a contract lawyer, not as an employee. And some people can't afford it. But if it is an option, and here again is a place where trust comes in, to be able to, you know, have some experience doing just working on one case. Mm Mm-hmm. And I know law firms now, you know, it's in this economy, people, well, should we really hire a person or do we only need them for a few months? And so, you know, get involved in local bar associations. And I think that there's a Facebook page now ever since the election. Uh, they, 
it, it's on as lawyers on the left, but they're changing right, the they name. They just changed the name. They just changed the name <laughs> to something more inclusive because not everybody thinks we're on the left. And there's like a lot of really interesting people on oh, it that. Has more than, I'm in the group. It has more than 100,000 people in it. So Yeah. So right now, that's a place to... <laughs> yeah, if I, yeah, true. I would be like, hey, I'm interested in this. Is there anybody who's looking for help? You know, no, I yeah, think... It, yeah, that's a huge, uh, huge opportunity. I think they're called lawyers yeah. for good government now or something, at least temporarily. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I'm, you know, obviously I'm not involved in that, but they're also starting state, mm -hmm. you know, small, smaller groups that aren't 120,000. And, you know, I think if you have an opportunity to volunteer a little bit during law school, get a feel for other organizations. I remember when I was in law school, did that women in the law thing. I was also had the opportunity to be on law review at Hastings and I couldn't do both. And mm -hmm. the lawyers who were running the women in law conference were like, you should do the women in law conference. It's going to give you connections. And that's what really matters. So I did not do the law review. I did do the women in law conference and I met a hell of a lot of people that I still know now. <laughs> right. I think that's right. I mean, people think like, oh, I have to do law review. And like, I made law review and hated it and did it and probably wasted a ton of time that I could have been doing something more productive with. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, getting clear on what makes sense for you and not just being like, oh, well, everybody tells me I have to do law review or tells me I have to do moot court. It's like, you know, people need to make these decisions about what actually makes sense for them. And also I do, I remember being in law school and thinking, and I worked for different organizations and private firms like almost every semester because the key is getting to know a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. I think that's particularly key. Any, anyone I know who's done public interest work of any type has said that's absolutely the key. You know, people hire you based on your work and your relationships. They're not hiring you based on, you know, where you went to school or something like that necessarily or your grades. Um, my law school roommate was actually a public interest person and she stopped looking at her grades after I think the first year because she was just like, you know what? I'm here to learn. As long as I pass, I really don't care. So she had someone else look at them to make sure she passed and they gave her a you know, thumbs up every semester. Like, yep, you passed. Don't worry about it. She's like, great. Don't need to worry about this. Yeah. I think the key thing is to just make sure you have a few other people who think like you do mm -hmm. and you know, the National Lawyers Guild is still out there and the ACLU and there's a lot of, there's a lot of us. I mean, if anybody listening to this is into interest in disability rights, they should certainly contact me because we have a whole bar association, disability rights. We have a law student part of that. The National Employment Lawyers Association is a group of plaintiffs, employment lawyers, a lot of whom have firms. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot, they're not nonprofits, but they're smaller firms. And they offer a different way to practice law. So there's a lot out there. And do you have any suggestions for law students or young lawyers who are interested in possibly striking out on their own creating a firm? Well, one thing I'll say about that, I, um, I actually work out of my house, and I have for 20 years. And along the way, I thought, oh, I should have an office. And I thought, really, should I pay rent for an office? Right. And especially, you know, with WeWorks and so many different work sharing situations, uh, I think you really got to keep your costs down. That is the trick. And really think hard about, is this cost necessary or do I just think it looks good? Another secret, of, not secret, but another reason I've been able to work as I do is co-counseling relationships. Hmm. So almost all the cases that I talk about in the book, I have done with co-counsel. Hmm. either in firms, uh, all the beginning cases were with the Goldstein, Borg, and Dardarian, and Ho firm, which is Oakland civil rights firm, one of those kinds of firms I was just talking about that, you know, is a law firm and they litigate cases on the plaintiff side, um, or nonprofits. I've only, of all the cases in my book and all the cases I've done, there's really only been two or three that I've just done by myself. Hmm. That's interesting. And why is that? Well, partly because I work at home without a staff. <laughs> and, without, um, and I have a thing in the book about co-counsel because it's, you know, when you're in a firm, you have your other partners, you have your associates or whatever to bounce ideas off of. But we can do that, especially, you know, with email and so much. I mean, we're having this great conversation where 
like two time zones away from each other. Right. You well, you know, really, we're, we're using Slack a lot and Trello and things like that. That, you know, I think even a lot of you know some of these Facebook groups are taking it off Facebook and like going into Slack because it's actually you know probably more secure and just easier to use. Yeah, you just don't. I mean, honestly, in many of these negotiations, people read about it in the book. I never met anybody on the. I don't like to use a firm term other side but never met him the whole thing was phone and email right what do you call so, them? your co-negotiators or something yeah, <laughs> yeah. Negotiating, negotiating partners partner. yes i like yeah, that so I, I think people who are interested in striking out on their own just really have to take advantage of all technology offers and the co-counseling arrangements and and you know that may be hit or miss at the beginning because you need to be in sync with the people you work with. I think that's one of the things I've learned along the way. It's not just the issues you want to work on. It's the people you're working with. Well, and I think it's also how you work and how much you work and, you know, how much control you have over the work that you're doing and all those kind of things that people don't necessarily give that much thought to until you're suddenly in a situation where you're overworked and you have no control and you know, that kind of thing. You're like, oh, I don't really mind the work. I just hate everything else about this. Well, that's how I ended up at home. I had I was working, for, so I when I got fired from the job, then I eventually ended up at this disability rights nonprofit, and I was there for four years, and one day woke up, and I said, oh, my God, my kids are 10 and 7, and, like, I never see them, mm -hmm. and it just wasn't tenable for me, so I decided I'm going to give it a go and start this home office, and I didn't really know how it was going to work out, and now, closer to the end of the story, I can see that it was, you know, the perfect leap at the time mm -hmm. no, i think there's a lot to be said for you know running your own thing controlling your own schedule controlling who you work with all those kind of things i mean certainly i realized i was a pretty terrible employee and i'm a much better person to be in charge so, you know. well that's another thing about structured negotiation that i think is i hope is clear in the book i couldn't figure out how to like write a whole chapter about it but you know the legal profession you file a lawsuit, you really lose a lot of control. You oh, know, yeah. the judges, the court orders, the scheduling conferences. You know, hopefully people are civil and they'll, you know, be a little flexible. But basically, you're just giving it over to rules that are pretty arbitrary. Pretty arbitrary and pretty old. So in structured negotiation, it's one of the hard parts is to keep the cases going without those rules. Mm -hmm. But one of the best parts is that you don't have those rules and you can keep the cases going on your own. Yeah, and that's a topic I wanted to touch on at least briefly before we wrap up. So you say in the book that there's no one sort of personality type that's necessarily best suited for this type of structured negotiation. Um, I mean, if somebody's interested in this idea and they want to explore it further, what are some skills that you think are really critical for these things, like keeping the case moving, you know, when you don't have a judge or a deadline looming? Yeah, that is what the last chapter is about. It's called the Structured Negotiation Mindset. And in some ways, it's the most important chapter in the book. But in the other, in other ways, I didn't want to scare people off. <laughs> I found it the most interesting chapter, to be honest. Yeah. Well, that, you know, it's funny, Allison. When I was deciding whether I really wanted to write a book, I said, okay, I got to write one chapter. And the chapter I wrote was that one. Oh, interesting. In, in different forms. But that was the thing I was most interested in. And the things I talk about in the chapter are patience equanimity, like we mentioned, trust, not jumping to conclusions, not making assumptions. And these are all things that when we're trained as a lawyer, we're kind of trained to be suspicious. Like, what if this happens? What if that happens? And we get ahead of where we really are. So I talk about that in the book. And I do agree that you don't need to be a certain personality because I think these things can be learned. Mm -hmm. Just like when we go to law school or when we're in certain kind of practices, we learn to be, you know, skeptical. Or right. So it seems like people sort of, lawyers have to kind of unlearn some of the things they might have picked up in law school for this to really be a successful approach. Yeah, unlearner or compliment. Because one of the things I realized in writing the book is you can be a very good advocate and be a peacemaker. Right. They're not mutually exclusive. But well, I think know, some of it is you can be a strong advocate without being a jerk. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Well, that I, I think I knew that already. But, <laughs> a know, lot of people in the legal profession seem to forget that. That's like, no, just because you're being a jerk doesn't mean you're actually advancing your client's position very firmly here. Yeah, or being aggressive or, 
you know, there's lots of, you know, in the book I talk about how having a mindfulness practice, you know, it's not required, but it can help you develop some of these traits. And I've been for several years to the lawyer meditation retreats they have out here in California, and they have them all over the country, really. And I've heard young lawyers say, and I just don't know if I can do this profession because it doesn't feel it meshes mm -hmm. with who who I am inside. And there's lots of different ways to be a lawyer. And I'm hoping that this book will just make one more way available to people. I think it's definitely worth a read. Um, so let's our final question. How can people learn more about your work? And where can they get the book? Uh, yeah, so my website is lflegal.com. My initials lf lflegal.com. Uh, and you'll find right there this forward slash book you can get right there and it'll tell you how to order it right now it's available only on the american bar association website um eventually it'll be on amazon but not till sometime in the first probably first half of next year so you can get it from the aba you can read what people are saying about it i have a section um used to be called advanced praise, but I'm putting in <laughs> what people are saying now, so I change it to praise. I have the table of contents up. I have some excerpts. So, um, yeah, I hope people read it. And let me put out my email here sure. because I'm happy to, you know, I'm an elder now, so I'm happy to talk to people on the path and, you know, share what I can. So you can reach me through the website, lflegal.com. There's a contact form, or my email is lf at lflegal.com. Okay, we can put that all into the show notes as well for easy reference. Well, with Thanks. that, unfortunately, we are out of time. I can attest the book is very interesting. It's also very readable, and I think it's very actionable. I liked the fact that you had sort of really specific ideas about, you know, how to make your opening letter and that kind of thing that I think could really be helpful to anyone who's interested in this topic or even just interested in, you know, I mean, I, I thought a lot of the ideas you had for the opening letter could probably go into demand letters as well. Um, so if you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review or rating on iTunes. We would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. Typically, our new episodes come out on Monday. If you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening. We'll talk soon. And a big thank you to Lainey for sharing her expertise. Thanks, Allison.